Dear colleagues, as it was said already a number of times, a part of the Greek National Network of Precision Medicine in Cardiology, equal partner of this Congress is the International Cardiomyopathy Network. Today, we have the pleasure and the honor to be and to have with us two significant figures uh, from the international uh, world of cardiomyopathies. Persons working actively and effectively to heal the traumas of this disease. Indeed, we have with us, of course, Professor Perry Elliott and Mr. Joel Rose. Chief Executive Officer, Cardiomyopathy UK. Please allow me to start with uh, uh, the case of Professor Perry Elliott, a renowned professor of cardiology, as I said before, in the international arena. Uh, professor Elliott is indeed professor uh, in the University of College of London, UCL, uh, serving the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences. Indeed, Professor Elliot, it is just very recently the new chairman of the Institute, indeed. Uh, congratulations, Perry, for this marvelous achievement and opportunity. Uh, Professor Elliot's research focuses on advances in genomics uh, and genomic medicine and their application to the diagnosis and management of inherited cardiovascular disease. In particular, uh, Professor Elliot has developed low cost, high throughput gene sequencing uh, technologies that interrogate the entire human genome. Through these new technologies, Professor Elliot uh, offers enormous opportunities for the advancement of knowledge about human health and disease. So it's really a great opportunity for us to have with us Professor Elliot. Professor Elliot is going to speak in brief about ICON, this international uh, cardiomyopathy, cardiomyopathy network and its manifesto for change, as the title indicates. Professor Elliot. Professor Vardas Panos, thank, thank you for those very kind words. And it's, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here this evening. Um, and I think we've already heard about the, the way in which the Greek network is, is indeed the vanguard in this mission to improve diagnosis and care for patients with cardiomyopathy. What I would like to do in the next 15 minutes or so is just to give you some idea about what ICON is and why we have established it. Now, I, as well as many of the speakers at this conference, have been involved in the cardiomyopathy world for, for many years. And I think we're all conscious of, of, a, of a long history for our subspecialty. The term cardiomyopathy was probably first used by, by this gentleman, Wallace Brigden, who created the term to, to make it clear that within the noise, if you will, within coronary disease, within hypertension, there was a family of complex diseases that deserved to be classified in their own right. Later on this evening, we will be hearing from uh, Gaetano Tieni, one of the, the leading lights from, from the cardiomyopathy world for many decades. And I'm sure he will tell us about the history of cardiomyopathy extending back to the 17th century, maybe even earlier. You know, we have names that maybe some of the younger generation are still familiar with, people like Lenek, who actually termed, who used the term hypertrophy for the first time. And then there are other people who I can almost guarantee you've never heard of, Robert Carswell. This was a gentleman that one of my previous fellows discovered at my own university, University College. And within our library of, of illustrations found these beautiful demonstrations of left ventricular hypertrophy from the 19th century. There is a long noble history of pathologists, so Morgagni, 
um, in Padova, along with William Harvey when he was working there. Someone you've probably never heard of, Schminke, but a German pathologist who was describing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at the turn of the 20th century. Donald Tier in London, who's often uh, ascribed the, the honor of being the, if you, if you like, the, the guy who started the modern story of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the 1950s, along with a variety of, of astute clinicians, people like Paul Wood in the UK, but also again, people that perhaps we've now forgotten, but Vulpien in Paris, who first described the clinical findings associated with outflow tract obstruction and Bell in the UK. And, you know, with the, in the 20, 21st century, we've had this sort of, I suppose, fashion for creating timelines of all those people that, or at least some of those people who contributed to this story. So in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, again, Eugene Brownwald, Doug Weigel in Canada, Andrew Morrow, who created the, the, the operation that we still use to this day to treat outflow tract obstruction, Barry Maron in the UK, Bill Cleland, who probably did the first myotomy, Lord Brock, who probably did the first myectomy, and then sort of the Hammersmith School of the 60s and 70s and 80s, John Goodwin, Celia Oakley, Bill McKenna, and people such as Ulrich Sigbart, who was one of the pioneers for alcohol septal ablation. And there, there are many other people you could put into this story from all around the world. The same is true for the science. Um, there are many scientists who contributed to our knowledge of the, the basic molecular biology of, of cardiomyopathy. I've chosen here to highlight Jonathan and Christine Seidman in Boston, who really set the ball rolling for our understanding of this family of monogenic disorders by discovering the first mutation in myosin heavy chain in a large family with familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, if you fast track to the present, we now have, I think, a very sophisticated understanding of the genetic mechanisms of disease. And with the development of new technologies such as CRISPR-Cas, we're developing new platforms for the creation of models in real time that we can do at scale, where we can, again, not only understand the basic biology of disease, but identify and test new therapies. <clears throat> and I think, you know, having been in this field now for almost three decades, I've, I've never known such a period of intense development for novel therapy. Some of this is technical, so with the development of, of new types of defibrillator, which reduce the risk, of, for example, of long-term lead complications. But even more exciting, the development of therapies which target the basic underlying etiology for disease. So, for example, a whole new class of drugs that activate or inactivate the, uh, if you like, the sarcomere motor in cardiomyocytes, which is the principal abnormality in many people with heart muscle disease. And perhaps most excitingly, and you know, something that we would have said was science fiction until very recently, we now potentially have the ability to correct the underlying genetic abnormalities themselves <clears throat> using a variety of new technology platforms, AAV delivered virus, uh, AAV delivered uh, gene to cells, but also exploiting this amazing technology discovered in archaea and other primitive organisms, the CRISPR-Cas technology, which enables us to insert or delete DNA, um, enabling us to turn on genes, turn off genes, to remove, remove mutated genes. But in all this excitement, in this amazing period of innovation, why do we need yet another organization to represent cardiomyopathy? And I think this is very much a matter of perspective. You know, how you look at all problems in life depends on you know, your, your own personal perspective. In the case of cardiomyopathy, uh, we have a number of key stakeholders. We have clinicians. So I've chosen to put Paul Wood here, largely because I think what we do as clinicians hasn't really changed from his era. We have new technologies, we have MRI, we have CT scans, but essentially as clinicians, what we try to do is to decide what it is that the patient has, and then hopefully to devise a therapy. If you're a basic scientist, and Lucy, forgive me, I've chosen to use your picture here, 
But there it's about what is the underlying molecular mechanism of this disease? And can we develop new therapies? And then the third key stakeholder in the cardiomyopathy world is, are, are the drug companies or the device companies who are now increasingly moving into this space. And the questions they ask themselves is, first of all, do we have a product that may be useful or can we develop one? Can we actually test that in a, in a meaningful clinical trial? And is there actually a market for any products that we do develop? I think whilst there is, as I've already implied, intense activity in each of these areas, I think there is still a failure to effectively communicate between these three traditional stakeholders. But of course, on this slide, there's also a fourth stakeholder that's missing. And that, of course, is the patient. Because they too have a perspective that perhaps as clinicians, we often don't hear. The shock of diagnosis was the biggest one. I, I, I was really shook up by that. Um, I, I felt fear. I was ignorant of the condition. And to a little extent, I was also mourning what I expected my life to be like in coming years. Shock, fear, ignorance, mourning, mourning for a loss of a future. You know, we, we take it for granted that you know, we, we're we coming into people's lives and, and having a huge impact, but we're in their lives for no more than 10 minutes or 20 minutes often, maybe once or twice a year. And we give them a diagnosis of a cardiomyopathy and then they leave. And the place they go to is a very lonely place. Some will try to learn about their condition to take better control, but they soon realize that what they have has implications not only for themselves, but for their families, maybe for their occupation. You know, it, it has significant ramifications for the whole of their life. We're fortunate to live in an information age, so patients will often go to the internet to get further information about their condition. And I sometimes maybe slightly flippantly call this a Google moment, because if you're a patient, you can get sucked into a, an information universe that can be very frightening. And it leaves you with a whole series of different questions about you know, where you go for the correct information, what you can do to protect yourself against the disease, what are the implications for your family? What will it mean to your future family? Are there treatments? What are the risks and benefits of those treatments? What are the side effects? What alternatives do you have as a patient? And something I think we do really bad is that we, that we are very reductionist in our approach to the impact of disease on an individual. We talk about chest pain or MYHA functional class or an internal pro-BMP level. But disease is much more than that. It's about a, a multi-system, a multi-dimensional impact on a person's life and how they feel about themselves, their self-perception, and their interaction with their family, their friends, and the rest of society. So I think we have a problem in communication, not only between the traditional stakeholders in disease, but also between the genuine impact of a disease on, on an individual, um, as well as you know, the scientists, the drug company, and their doctor. And this is where we would like ICON to come in. ICON we see as a, an organization which facilitates, that promotes a new dialogue between each of the key stakeholders in cardiomyopathy whether they be healthcare professionals, whether they be scientists, whether they be the pharma industry, whether they be the patient and their family. The aims of ICON, some of which are listed here, are to create a network of these different stakeholders. It is, of course, about education and training of healthcare professionals, um, but it's also about the promotion and facilitation of research for the public benefit it's to disseminate the results of research, but also ICON, one of its goals is to act as an advocate for people with these diseases. The organisation is registered as a charity in the UK, but it is very much um, an internationally facing organisation. And I'm very privileged and honoured to work with a, a number of key individuals on these, uh, the board of ICON, who have been chosen in a way to represent 
these different stakeholders, whether they be clinicians, um, whether they look after adults or children, whether they represent patients or the basic science community. We've been saying that this is um, yeah, in partnership with the Greek Network, our first conference. It, it isn't really. I, I have to pay tribute to Alice Linhart in Prague, who gave us a first opportunity to go public back in that those heady pre-COVID days at the end of 2019. Obviously, COVID has delayed our, our launch in many respects, but we have tried to use this period to provide some public facing material. This is one example of, of, of what ICON is trying to achieve. And this was the brainchild of two researchers within our depart department, Alex Protonotarius and Max Lorenzini. And what we've created here is a monthly platform which allows um, investigators, young investigators from all over Europe and indeed elsewhere to present their work to their peers and to, to be challenged, but also to engage in a, an exciting scientific dialogue. Over the next three days, we're going to be partnering with the Greek National Network. And I think you've already heard that in its quiet way, it really is a beacon of excellence. I think what the Greek Network has, has achieved over the past two to three years puts countries like my own, which maybe has, you know, more income, we have, we're a richer country, and yet you've already made greater strides in creating a genuinely effective network than we have and many other countries have. So over the next year or so, um, we are now trying to obtain the resources to engage in an active policy development program and to develop our advocacy role. Um, we will be engaging in a, a research priority setting exercise and of course we will be developing new platforms for education and training. Um, it's a, I urge you to keep an, an eye on what we're doing and to, and to join with us because this is meant to be a network of, of different stakeholders, young, old, scientists, clinicians and industry. And we really look forward to working with the Greek network and many other networks over coming years. Thank you very much for your attention.